The following interview was conducted with Warren H. Stevenson, Professor Emeritus of Mechanical Engineering for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Thursday, August 13, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Good afternoon, Dr. Stevenson. Thank you very much. Let's start. Uh, tell us a little bit about where you were born and your siblings and early years. Okay, well, I was born in Rock Island, Illinois, okay. but uh, grew up in Stanford, Illinois, which is a town of 500 people in the middle of the state, surrounded by cornfields. Uh, I have no siblings, <laughs> so that simplifies that discussion. Sure. What about the early years, early grade school, and then talk about high school? Well, as I said, Stanford was a small town, but it this was before school consolidation, so they did have a grade school and a high school. Both actually uh, quite good. I think they got a good education, okay. generally speaking. And Were there uh, any student activities that you participated in, or how large was well, the school? Well, uh, there were 17 in my graduating class <laughs> in high school. I was class president the last two years. As far as other activities, well, I was involved in sports, um, although that slacked off in the latter part of high school. I was working part-time at a garage at DeSoto Plymouth dealership in uh, another town about five miles away, and uh, so I didn't have a, that much time left for sports. Sure. But. Um, Generally, it was uh, Oh, then the school must not have been that large if you were only 17 in your class. Oh, no, they weren't. Yeah. But was it four years? It was, yeah, high school was four years, grade school was eight years. Okay. Uh, but the community supported the schools strongly. It was, a, of course, a farming community. The largest structure in town was a grain elevator. Uh, but the... Uh, it was a, a fairly wealthy community, and the schools were well supported and, for the most part, well staffed. So, uh, I don't have any many bad memories. <laughs> Sounds good. Yeah. Then, uh, what came next? Did, is this when you came on to Purdue? Right. I, at was some point, I became interested in mechanical engineering. Probably working at the garage. Um, and of course, at that time, boys tended to work on their own cars. Uh, and there were cars that you could work on because they didn't have uh, everything controlled by a computer that uh, was a mystery and that you didn't have the equipment to handle. So, um, in any case, I got interested in mechanical engineering and my choices were University of Illinois or Purdue, basically. I actually got a scholarship to come to Purdue. Um, I learned about Purdue from actually a cousin, an older cousin, who was a civil engineer. So, uh, and plus that was farther away from home, which seemed like not a bad idea at that time. Um, and that turned out to be a good decision. So I uh, started. Oh, well, Did tell well. when you entered, what was kind of the campus like and your program and the professors and well, tell us the, about the campus uh, like. Okay, the, I think there were about 15,000 on the campus then. A uh, the ratio of about four boys to one girl, which was good for the girls, I guess. Um, and, uh, of course, at that time, we did have freshman in, the freshman engineering program, which has continued through to this day, they call it something else now, but that's what it is. And so we uh, we learned things like graphics, drawing, uh, over in uh, what was then the Michael Golden Building, an old hot <laughs> building with great big uh, oak top grafting tables. And, uh, <laughs> So there was that, but then of course there were all the other classes, uh, math and physics and chemistry. Uh, Where'd you live on campus? 
Well, the first year on campus, I lived in uh, Harrison Courts, which was, it was an ex I guess, a sort of an experimental residence where hall was it? program. Do you recall where it was, it was located? It was on Harrison Street on oh, the okay. south part of campus. One-story buildings, and they were set up so there was a small common area and then a number of rooms around that, but a, not a large number, perhaps uh, maybe eight. And then this, this was repeated, of course, many times. But so you were with a very small group. So I was there for a year, uh, and there were no meals served there, so I ate at the Union. Did they have such a thing as a meal plan, or did you, how did that work? Uh, to be honest, I don't remember. They okay. may have had some sort of meal plan. But, but you'd, have, you'd paid in advance. You didn't have to pay each time you eat. Well, I'm not sure. That's okay. what I'm saying. I don't remember for sure <laughs> okay. how that worked. Sure. Um, and then the uh, my sophomore year, I got involved. Well, I joined uh, Rochdale Co-op House, which uh, the co-op houses were cheap fraternities, if you will. They, you worked, did whatever work needed to be done around the house, and uh, that uh, helped reduce the cost. But it was a, a good group of people, and I still actually maintain contact with some of those. Uh, various things happened there, like the time we set the dorm roof on fire celebrating Pearl Harbor Day, or some day or another, I can't remember, <laughs> by uh, igniting a railroad flare and putting it on a, in a glass ashtray on the roof of the dorm. And unfortunately, that cracked the ashtray and the roof caught on fire. We went on from there, right? And uh, But we managed to take care of it, and nobody Nobody knew, but we can my, handle it. my friend and I. Yeah. I won't mention his name. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> uh, but, you know, we had the usual college activities. Sure, and, uh, exactly. So that was enjoyable. Uh, I got involved with the Purdue Christian Foundation, which was then in a house across from the armory. And that... Uh, where I actually met the woman who's now my wife. Oh, good. My sophomore year. What course of study was she taking? Uh, she was in education. So we started dating, and uh, I had to keep studying, of course, <laughs> which I did. Um, you asked earlier about some of the professors. Right. Uh, there were, I had a number of very good ones through the years. Uh, one in mechanical engineering, especially J.B. Jones, was uh, taught fluid mechanics and thermodynamics, uh, primarily thermodynamics when I was at that stage. Uh, I took two thermodynamics courses from him. Uh, he was an outstanding teacher. And he later went to uh, Virginia, Polytech. Um, I got interested in physics. Uh, along with along with the ME. Along with right, along with the ME, and I started uh, even as an undergraduate to take some some physics courses. Uh, I took an uh, advanced physics course. Let's see, modern physics. Course, I'm sorry. Uh, in my senior year, I guess that was, which uh, introduced quantum mechanics concepts and a number of, of uh, modern physics uh, principles. And that uh, turned out to be useful later, as we'll see here shortly. Okay. Uh, between my junior and senior year, I got married, and so the final year, uh, my senior year, we uh, lived in uh, a mobile home. Where was that located? West Lafayette, which was uh, on 
Route 52, and now it would be uh, sort of in the front of the Payless grocery store parking lot. Uh, that was an 8 by 36 mobile home which, if you calculate the square feet, isn't a whole lot, but we managed pretty nicely. And then uh, I graduated in 1960, in May, and took a job with the Martin Company in Denver. And we had the, the mobile home pulled to Denver and put in a... So it sounds like the Bob Hope movie with the yeah, caravan that yes. he had. <laughs> Uh, so it was put in a mobile home park out there, which is now the parking lot of a Sears store. In fact, we were out there uh, a couple of weeks ago with our family and uh, drove by the, the old home site. Um, it's nice to do that after you're gone for a long period of time to see yes. what the changes are. I've done that with the house I grew up in. Anyway, that was uh, actually in Lakewood, Colorado, which is a western suburb of Denver. Uh, while we were out there, well first, my job at the Martin Company was, was uh, really a great position to start in. This was the beginning of the space age. It was actually before... And after Sputnik. Uh, it was after Sputnik, before the U.S. had launched a satellite, in fact. But the work I was doing was in what they call advanced design, which was designing, well, really putting together information for proposals to the government to get contracts to build re-entry vehicles. Uh, this was before the Mercury program. And also Space Lab. This is really on the ground floor. Orbital vehicles, right. So I was doing things like designing escape rockets for uh, the Mercury-type capsules. Many things, this was, uh, it's called advanced design, which makes might make you think that it's more than it was. It was really almost preliminary design just looking at basic concepts and doing almost back of the envelope calculations just to see if something would work in general. And then once you decided on a path, well then somebody else would, would work out the details. Um, but it gave a nice overview of uh, that whole business at a time when that was the hottest thing in town. So, um, let's see, by the time we left Martin, which was September or August of 61, uh, we had two children. Uh, the last one, the second one, our second one was born in July of that year, and in August, uh, or actually late June, sorry, and in August of that year, I climbed Long's Peak in Colorado, which I'm not sure it made my wife particularly happy, but uh, I did it. <laughs> but I can say I did it. And, uh, it was a great experience, except on the way somewhere on the mountain, I lost the roll of film that I finished on the way up, and uh, those were the best shots. So. They're it's, still up here. It's still, yeah, well, it's still up there, so <laughs> somewhere, gotcha. maybe somebody will find it someday. <laughs> well, anyway, so in, well, in August or September, whenever school started in the fall of 61, uh, I came back to Purdue to start a master's program, and my wife still had a year of school left, and she uh, was finishing her bachelor's degree. And we had the two children. We'd sold the mobile home in Colorado, and we needed something bigger, so we got a, an eight by 38 foot 
mobile home in the same, in the same home park. park we've been in before. But that extra two feet turned out to be enough to give us the space we needed. So, um, so then, uh, well, I should point out the reason we came back actually was because we had originally planned on my wife finishing in Colorado, finishing her degree, and then I would do a master's out there. But it turned out it was going to take her two years if she tried to finish out there, so we didn't want to do that. Right. Uh, and I got a, an assistantship to come back and uh, do my master's program. And then um, I got one of those things that comes along in life that turns out later to be critical, although it may not seem like it at the time. Uh, I had started with this assistantship uh, and was going to do some, some heat transfer research uh, on supercritical hydrogen which would have been okay, but it wasn't exactly exciting. But uh, mechanical engineering had just received a grant from the National Science Foundation to develop a completely new approach to undergraduate laboratories. So the uh, person who was leading the heat transfer part of that effort was Pete McFadden. And so I switched my uh, research assistantship to that activity, which in my particular piece of that was to build an optical interferometer to study heat and mass transfer. And as I said, I had an interest in physics in any case, and I took a physics course in spectroscopy, which uh, I never really used spectroscopy per se, but a lot of the material in that course turned out to be helpful. Um, so I was building this, well, designing and building this mock, what's called a mock Sander interferometer to study free convection and diffusion. And the, uh, that turned out to be very, very interesting. That led into your research with the laser, whatever else? Well, that was, that was before the laser, actually. Okay. So I was using a, uh, a mercury arc source filtered to get a single line of mercury out, a green line, to get a monochromatic enough source to form interference fringes. Um, that took a while to learn how to do that um, because things have to be adjusted very, very precisely to within wavelengths of light before you see anything. But we finally did the job. Uh, another ME professor, Val Bergdolf, had uh, done work with interferometry at uh, one of the Army research labs. And so he helped with that part. Um, anyway, so we finally got that, got the interferometer working, and then the question was, how do you employ that in an undergraduate laboratory? And so we hooked up a TV camera with it so you could see the, so a large group could see the fringes all same time and uh, set up some nice experiments that they could run and it turned out to be very effective so we ended up building I think three of those and in the, the design was copied in other places finally and even in Brazil as I recall uh, it was very it was a simple design completely manufactured in the mechanical engineering machine shop, the mechanical parts of it, the uh, 
mirrors and beam splitters were purchased, but uh, it was otherwise homemade. And uh, so that worked out very nicely. Now, unfortunately, it's no longer used for various reasons, but one of the, one of the problems was that I had a hard time teaching the rest of the faculty how to use it. <laughs> so I ended up every, uh, every semester spending a lot of time uh, in that lab uh, after, you know, after I was on the faculty <coughs> keeping it going. But in any case, uh, it taught me a lot. And then for my PhD, I built a bigger interferometer, really big, 10 inch diameter optics. Um, but basically the same design. And then, uh, except the adjustments in this case were motorized so you could remotely control the mm -hmm. instrument. And then I used that for some studies in, in uh, mass transfer in particular. And at about that time, the laser showed up. In particular, the helium neon laser, uh, which is the red laser that uh, many people have seen. Although the red laser pointers you see these days are not helium neon, they're something else. But Anyway, I, I was fairly sure that I purchased the first helium neon laser on the Purdue campus, the first commercial one that was available, and that was uh, that was used in uh, basically an evaporation study to measure the evaporation rate of liquids in a container, so we could actually watch as the liquid level dropped by fractions of the wavelength. And that led to some papers and uh, some minor renown on the world stage. Efforts, right, uh, okay. Including a trip to Czechoslovakia, actually, what was then Czechoslovakia for a conference. Um, well then the question was, what do I do after the PhD? And I hadn't really planned on staying at Purdue. Um, I should point out that between, at some point in the cycle here, and I can't remember exactly, maybe at the start of my PhD, I was awarded what was called the Ford Forgivable Loan, which meant, <coughs> excuse me, which meant that it was like a fellowship if you after you graduated went into teaching. And I was interested in that anyway at that point, so it sounded like a good deal. So I had one of those and that carried with it some teaching responsibility as graduate students uh, in, in the area of heat transfer in my case. And that sort of reinforced my uh, interest in the teaching profession. Right. So then the question was, where should I teach? And now that you're getting ready to finish. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And I interviewed uh, two other at Purdue and two other uh, universities, Rice and uh, University of Texas at Austin. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, Well, I won't go into those. The one at Rice was really interesting. But, uh, but I was interested in the University of Texas, nice people. Uh, but that would have been a, a heat transfer position. And at that time, uh, Richard Grosch was head of mechanical engineering. He was later dean, later president of Rensselaer Polytech. Uh, but he said that Engineering had taken over all of classical physics except optics and acoustics. And he thought maybe we should look into those areas and maybe I should be the one to look into optics. And so that sounded like a great idea. And uh, 
as a result, I stayed at Purdue and started on the faculty in the uh, fall of 1965. I suppose at this time you say, and the rest was history, but anyway. Um, Can you talk a little bit about your research once you got on board as a faculty member? Right, well, actually, two things. One, I, I developed a course, a graduate level course, we call it engineering optics, 500 level course. Uh, and that was a course that is still being taught after whatever, I was 65, so over 40 years. That's great. Uh, I'm not teaching it anymore, but <laughs> someone is. And it was, uh, in a sense, I developed it for the students I was going to have myself for their benefit, but also for other students in other areas that might want to use optical measurement techniques in their research. And that's been the way the course has gone. Uh, it's been pretty effective in both of those areas. Uh, I later developed a 600 level course in coherent optics, which is related to laser illuminated systems. And the research um, started out, well, that was, as I said, the space. <coughs> Boy, I need a drink or something. You need some water? Yeah, I would. Okay, let's see. Oh, I should back up a little. Okay. Uh, during my graduate program, uh, my PhD program, uh, I was encouraged, and in fact all the students who were then in the heat transfer area where I was were encouraged to take physics courses. So I took a number of physics courses. Mm -hmm. Electromagnetic theory and mechanics, and uh, others along this uh, the spectroscopy course I mentioned earlier. Um, and the, uh, the teacher for the electromagnetics and the mechanics courses, 500 level courses, was Vivian Johnson. An excellent teacher. So I got a lot out of that and enjoyed it. Um, I think it's somewhat unfortunate that 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 has changed in recent years, and, and uh, at least mechanical engineering students are not taking physics courses to any great extent. Uh, a few of them, but. <clears throat> it's not, uh, there's so many other things <laughs> coming in that, uh, that they haven't done that, which uh, probably is, as I said, unfortunate in some respects. But nevertheless, all of that was good uh, grounding for my own thesis work and for my further research because in the optics area at that time, we were the only mechanical engineering school in the country that was doing anything with optics, you know, that had an optics program at the graduate level. Uh, and so I was at conferences and whatever, I was dealing with physicists for the most part. So in any case, When I went to Martin, it was right at the beginning of the space age when I started on the faculty. It was right at the beginning of the laser age. And as I mentioned, I'd had a little experience with lasers. And so we actually were able to get some funding to build some, uh, which I, one of my first graduate students spent his master's 
program building lasers, helium neon lasers. And he was very good at it. And we learned a lot from that. Sure. Um, but then we started doing research in other areas. And uh, one of the other graduate students at that same time, a master's student, was uh, doing some research on determining quality of lenses using Fourier transform principles, which I won't go into here, but in any, in any case, uh, that was his uh, thesis. And he later went on and worked at IBM Research in San Jose, California for a while, and then he started his own company uh, building instrumentation to measure laser beam fog. And I haven't talked to him recently, but if he hasn't retired, he's still at it. And, uh, that company has been pretty successful, competing, in fact, well with the Japanese. Um, and then, you know, other students came along. Um, one of the more interesting was uh, Bala Subramania, normally known as Bala, and now he goes by the name Bala Mania. That uh, Bala did the first work in our lab in the area of laser velocimetry. Some very preliminary things, conceptual things, primarily. Um, <clears throat> and then he went on um, to do a number of notable things. One of the first was he uh, designed the uh, laser scanner you see in grocery stores and other retail stores. That was uh, using holography principles was doing that as a consultant, so he didn't get rich on it, <laughs> uh, didn't get the patent. But then he later uh, started several companies. The first one was Digital Optics, which he later uh, sold to Steven Spielberg. And some of the, it was a, uh, basically, they developed a technology to merge digital images with film images, conventional yeah. film images. Pretty, pretty good. And they were used, uh, for example, in the early Star Wars movies. And then he's since started a number, but he sold that one and started some other companies. And, uh, very successful. Um, and then we started down the uh, laser velocimetry track, which turned out to be a fairly long track. And laser velocimetry is a technique for using the Doppler shift of scattered laser light to measure the velocity of particles moving with the fluid. And assuming the particles are in fact moving with the fluid, this allows you to measure the fluid velocity. And this uh, we got into this area very early and uh, made a number of contributions to the development of the instrumentation. Uh, had a number of graduate students that worked in that area. And this uh, expanded. Uh, we did some work on particle sizing using some of the same t techniques. So that lasted for a good part of my research career. And then I was at a meeting in Portugal. There was a regular meeting every, well, we had, we had held the first, probably the first two meetings on laser velocimetry in the world here at Purdue. Yes, I know that. I was going to answer uh, the first one, sir. And then uh, that was a uh, conjecture with a colleague of mine, Doyle Thompson, who was on the fluid mechanics side mm -hmm. of our research. Uh, 
and then at some point uh, there was a uh, well actually there were three we held three meetings here finally but then a meeting started to be held in other locations and there was a, uh, a meeting then in Portugal an international meeting that began and ran every other year for a number of years <coughs> and so I would go to that meeting regularly and at the the last one I went to, I was about to give a, a talk, and one of my colleagues in the audience introduced me as the grandfather of laser velocimetry, and I decided I've been in this business way too long. <laughs> so uh, after that, um, I decided I'd probably done what I could do in that business, and uh, it was time to look into some other things. So we got into some other areas, uh, computer, what's called computer vision metrology, where you use imaging, computer imaging to make precise measurements. Uh, we got into some work, some other metrology work, metrology being mm -hmm. precision mechanical measurements. Uh, some other work using the optical triangulation principle to do uh, precise measurements on non-contact measurements on parts uh, and develop some really looking at some fundamental issues in uh, instruments of that type. Uh, we did one interesting little study with that where we actually used type of instrument to measure uh, the thermal expansion of ceramic circuit boards for, I was for uh, the Naval Avionics Lab in Indianapolis and the circuit boards were used in high performance aircraft where temperatures went through a wide range and you didn't want things expanding and breaking circuit contacts, the circuits that were patterned on the boards, and they uh, they didn't really have good information on how these boards behaved under in that sense, you know, to sure. the precision they needed. Um, <clears throat> so, in any case, um, and then about that time. Well, I should back up a little bit. Um, at some point in my career, uh, I started to get into administration. And the first piece of that was uh, the head of the school then, who was Wynn Phillips, uh, asked me to chair the systems measurement control group, which is one of like, six groups a faculty within the, school. within the School of Mechanical Engineering. Um, and then I was, um, let me think, I'll make sure I get the right order here. Um, I became graduate chairman. Actually, that may have been before that, <laughs> uh, that I became graduate chairman, responsible for all the graduate program activities in the school. Then I was chairman of the Systems Measurement Control Group. Um, and then uh, I was asked by uh, then Dean of Engineering Henry Yang to step in and uh, fill in the position of uh, Assistant Dean for research which uh, had been held by Frank in Prepara, who was the head of the mechanical engineering school. But he, had, uh, he was going on sabbatical, so 
for a, a period, so Henry asked me to step in in his place, which I did. Um, and then one thing led to another, and I finally ended up spending incrementally more time, all the time, in the dean's office, uh, less time in mechanical engineering. <coughs> and, the, uh, and the, at some point then, it was, the position was made associate dean for research and graduate programs for the, what was then the schools of engineering, it's now the college of engineering. So that was, uh, that was actually a very interesting period. I still did some teaching and some research, but as time went on, that became more and more difficult. And you know, I, I finally decided I couldn't. I had to go one way or the other, and otherwise my students were going to suffer if I tried to do both. And the administration side was, at that point, sort of a critical stage, so I basically put more of my effort in that direction. Uh, it became a full-time, it became a full-time position. You were going to mention, uh, we mentioned before we got started, but aren't the planning for Armstrong? Right. You were involved in that? And that was, well, let me oh, okay. preface that with uh, make some points about administration. It's, good. of course, if you're on the faculty, then you see administration as an impediment. You know, they're always not letting you do what you want to do. Uh, They're an impediment unless they're giving you money. <laughs> then they're <laughs> they're happy, although you're never giving them enough or space. Um, and at that time, uh, well, first I did. Uh, you know, as associate dean for research, I tried to help the faculty you know, find research sponsors. Occasionally, I'd bring groups of faculty together to talk about uh, some sort of interdisciplinary proposal. Uh, some of those efforts got fairly large. Uh, but for the most part, faculty, you know, they do their own work. They get their contacts with sponsors and get the research funding. And uh, the dean's office is really not involved other than to just look over things to make sure that there aren't some problems showing up, such as, well, that doesn't happen very often in engineering, but sometimes there are rules about dealing with human subjects, or animals for that matter, and uh, you want to make sure you don't get on the wrong side of those or you can get in big trouble. So, but that, uh, <coughs> that sort of effort was mostly on the faculty side. Um, and then on the well, associate dean for research and graduate program, so I dealt a lot with the graduate school and issues relating to uh, that. And I dealt with uh, the vice president for research, and actually had a position in the Purdue Research Foundation for a time that included activities across school boundaries, looking at research across the university, all of which was educational. <laughs> um, sure. And it, it gave me a good view of the administration, of what, what is involved, and, uh, and there is a lot involved. Uh, administrators, for the most part, are not just sitting there <laughs> smoking their pipe and thinking. Uh, <clears throat> well, they might love to do that. Well, in any case, at uh, one point, my one of my main 
efforts in that position became basically space czar, that is, square footage czar. Uh, we were getting very, very tight on space and engineering, and the, uh, there were plans to expand the faculty, expand in particular the graduate programs, and of course if you expand, and we needed, we were going to bring in new faculty, and new faculty tend to come in with needs for equipment and space, and they're going to be bringing in graduate students. And so it was becoming critical. And so I was constantly faced with trying to find space for somebody to do something. Uh, and it was almost rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic because <laughs> there wasn't. <laughs> Never goes away. It, the, uh, but I managed for some period of time that, uh, to find things somewhere that we could use. Um, but uh, Dean Schwartz and the Dean decided that we needed to look into doing something to increase the space available. And the only way to get that, it looked like, was to build it. So he charged me with developing a master plan for new engineering space for the engineering schools. <coughs> so that became a several year process. We uh, oh, yeah. got the, uh, the faculty, the heads of each of the faculties to submit a request and then uh, Put together a, I put together a preliminary plan, which turned out to uh, represent a 50, I think it was a 56 percent increase in space in engineering, uh, which raised some eyebrows. <laughs> and uh, you know, the comment was, "Well, the heads are always going to ask for more than they really need." So, but nevertheless, we took this plan to then President Beering and uh, presented it to him and to uh, Bob Ringel, who's then uh, effectively the provost, provost, you know, he's executive vice president. And Ken Burns, who was the treasurer, Bob Crowler. And uh, they said, gee, that looks great. Uh, but you need to get together with the university architect, and, uh, get them involved, refine this. So we went back, uh, and the university architect, Tom Schmank, a uh, very nice guy to work with. Uh, decided we should hold some uh, sessions, I can't remember what they were called, but basically getting faculty in each of the schools together. Get some input. To get their input directly and, uh, and come up with something that looked reasonable. So we did that. Uh, I went around to all the faculties and had these meetings long meetings, day-long meetings. And at the end, we had come up with, uh, guess what, a 56% increase in the space <laughs> that we needed, or maybe a little more even at that point. Um, but we had a little more justification than we had the first time around. And so we took that back to President Bering, and he approved it. I think he probably thought it would take 20 years to do it. Um, but at least we had a plan. And so the, uh, 
then you have to start working on the next step to refine this further and, and get the money. And uh, Martin Jiski became president, and it turned out that he was an amazing man when it came to raising money. So that was fortunate because at that point the state was less than amazing in providing money. So the plan was in place. Um, one interesting feature was when we had first talked about this, we had thought about putting all of these facilities out uh, near the airport where the university owned a lot of property. And when uh, President Jischke came on board, he looked at the plan, he looked at the uh, campus map, and he noted the uh, what were called the married student courts on State Street, and said, what's that? <laughs> and it was explained that, well, these were student courts, uh, of course, housing for married students. Uh, they were pretty old. They were in need of major renovation or replacement. And uh, <coughs> he said, well, there seems to be a lot of housing available in West Lafayette. Maybe it's time to use that for something else. And so that was the beginning of Discovery Park. And that uh, was a brilliant <laughs> decision, I think, because it brought all the, the research close, closer to the main campus so that it would be much easier for students and faculty to uh, interact with uh, those research laboratories. <clears throat> so the final plan uh, ended up totaling somewhere in the neighborhood of $400 million uh, funding required to make it happen. One piece of that was the nanotechnology facility, which was sort of, sort of the cornerstone of Discovery Park. That was, I believe, a $65 million facility all on its own. And uh, Fortunately, some alums came through with the money. I think uh, I think the state threw in five million dollars just so they'd have their foot in the door. But otherwise, it was all private funding, and that was sort of the pattern then for most of the rest of it. Uh, the civil engineering uh, structures lab, which is located on South River Road, known as the Bowen for uh, the research. Bowen Right, the Bowen Lab. Uh, that was all privately funded. Uh, it was a major addition to chemical engineering that was privately funded. The uh, biomedical engineering building. Uh, the state may have put some money into that, but again, it was a small piece of the total. Uh, and the, the state did put a significant sum into the uh, Armstrong building. Let me interject. How, then, how was the site chosen? Did you For the Armstrong come? building? Yeah. Well, um, after great thoughts were... Yeah. Well, the, the Armstrong building, well, the, the civil engineering uh, Bowen Labs and the Burke Nanotechnology Labs are, I would say, pure research in the sense that they're not classes taught in those buildings. So, they didn't necessarily need to be close to campus, or at least real close. Um, but the Armstrong building was going to house aeronautics and astronautics, uh, materials, science and engineering, the uh, freshman engineering program, all of which are involved teaching. Um, plus some other, the women in engineering and uh, the minority, minority program, and right. program and so forth. So those really needed to be close to the core campus and uh, 
that site, uh, many old timers will remember, was where the uh, temporary FWA buildings were located that were supposed to have disappeared decades before. And uh, somehow it managed to stick around. So it was fairly easy to pick that site. It was close to the core engineering campus and uh, the space was available. So that uh, took care of that. Took care of that. Actually, the building was initially, I named the building initially the Millennium Building simply to have something to call it. Um, but then at some point, uh, yeah, right. it was named the Neil Armstrong Building, mm -hmm. which was quite good, actually. Right. Yeah. I should mention that uh, being in the Dean's office, uh, I was involved with the Dean's Advisory Committee, and Neil Armstrong was one of the members of that for a number of years. So he would be on campus uh, twice a year, and uh, I would get a chance to meet him. But very nice guy, mm -hmm. quiet, unassuming, but, uh, but sharp. Um, So anyway, that uh, was an effort, and there are some other pieces of that that are, well, the mechanical engineering dish edition is starting now, uh, it's a big hole in the ground. That's a major part of that program, and uh, Herrick Laboratories, which is part of mechanical engineering, <coughs> will get a major upgrade, they seem to have been able to get most of the funding for that rounded up. Uh, there's some other pieces that haven't happened yet, uh, remodeling Grissom Hall for industrial engineering, and, uh, doing something with nuclear engineering, we haven't, and I'm not sure where that stands, if anywhere at the moment. But overall, it was a, it was a big program. It, it was implemented, implemented an amazingly, an amazingly short amount of time, uh, simply because the funds were collected in an amazingly short amount of time, considering the magnitude of the effort. So uh, that's one of the things you can do in administration that you can't do as a professor. So, so that was a good way to wrap things up. Yeah. You were the, uh, weren't you the interim, you were the interim head at one time? Well, I was, yes. Um, of mechanical of right. college. Okay. Um, yeah, the head of uh, M.E. Frank Ingrapera uh, stepped down to become the dean at Notre Dame. And so we were searching for a new head, and I was in the dean's office, but um, we needed somebody to be the head in M.E an interim head, and so I took that position too. Um, and actually I recruited the uh, current head, Dan Perlman, who was then at Arizona State, but he had been a PhD student at Purdue, and I had been on his advisory committee, in fact, and we had some joint uh, research interests, and so we had been in contact over the years and I thought he would make a good candidate, so I encouraged him to become one, and he got the job, and I think he's done a fine job. Yeah, so, but in the period from the time uh, Frank and Prepare left until Dan came on board, which was about, well, it was July till March, I think. Okay. You had I a couple of extra hats to wear. Had to, <laughs> yeah, I also had to be head of ME, <laughs> at least, at least keep, keep things from falling apart. I didn't, <laughs> didn't have to do anything spectacular, but. <clears throat> Just keep the doors on, right, yeah. But that, that wasn't that difficult. Right. Let's talk a little bit, you know, one thing, the Warren and Judy Stevenson Scholarship. And, ah. um, also want to make a mention of the researchers, being a member of the class of 1960, also made a contribution to the new Archives and Special Collections facility, and you were on that. Committee. Right. And then a member of the class. 
Well, the Warren and Judy Stevenson Scholarship Fund was actually a fund started upon my retirement by my former graduate students. Mm -hmm. Very nice. I contributed to that. And it's a, uh, I don't know what the amount of money in there is now, but it's a, an endowment. So that every year a certain amount of money is available right. to offer and it's used to enhance existing fellowship funds for graduate students so that, uh, or, or for assistantship students. Students that there's a particular interest, you know, they're very good top students and there's an interest in bringing them. Uh, so this is a way of giving them a little extra support right. they wouldn't otherwise have. So, uh, and my wife's name is on that because we had a policy of, or a practice, not really a policy, of uh, entertaining our graduate students at our home uh, about twice a year. And, uh, and she's very good in human relations. So uh, they uh, gave that money for her on her behalf as well as mine. Good. Let's talk about family. Do you, uh, you have children? I have three children. Okay. Did uh, they come to Purdue? Uh, they all went to Purdue. Okay. Uh, two of them graduated from here. The other one went elsewhere. Um, they have seven grandchildren, two of whom are married, <laughs> uh, which seems hardly possible. But <laughs> and in fact, uh, we were in Colorado the last week of August for our 50th wedding anniversary celebration with all of our children, the grandchildren, and their spouses. Yeah. And that was great fun. That's right. Um, let's see. You uh, asked retire about retirement? Tell us about what you're doing in your retirement. Ah, uh, well, in my retirement. I retired in... Uh, did you go on half-time or did you just retire? Well, I was on... Uh, was, For a research, <laughs> there was an option. That you it, was, it was a little complicated. I started to go on... Uh, I was on 75% time for a while, 25% off, um, because I was in a, in a situation then where that would, would actually work without too much trouble. So... Uh, I was off from uh, basically Christmas till spring break for a couple of uh, years, and we spent that time in Florida in a condo we had purchased, and then uh, I was going to go retire full time, but uh, a new dean was hired, Linda Katehi, and I was asked to come back full time to sort of help with the transition. So I did that for a year and then I retired, completely retired in May of uh, 03. Okay. And in May of, o or in April of 04, we purchased a home in Florida, Puna Gorda. Uh, August of 04, Friday the 13th, uh, Hurricane Charlie went right over the top of it. And so I learned a lot about uh, repairing homes after hurricanes and uh, about structural requirements for homes to be safe during hurricane. Uh, it's a whole new span. <laughs> it was, yes, it was a, another learning experience. I just as soon would have avoided, actually. But in any case, uh, now all that's taken care of and we spent eight months down there and four months in Lafayette during the summer. Okay. Uh, down there we've gotten involved with, Judy and I are both on the curriculum committee for the Lifelong Learning Institute which is operated out of uh, Edison State College and uh, we also I teach a course on energy and global warming Coordinate, both coordinated different courses where we bring other 
outside speakers in. Um, and as I said, we're on the curriculum committee. It's uh, actually a very strong program. And then uh, after the hurricane, I got involved with Team Kuna Gorda, which was a, a group that was put together, a grassroots group put together to define a rebuilding of the city after the hurricane. And the first piece of that effort was raising funding to bring in a, an urban planner, nationally recognized urban planner from the University of Miami to uh, come up with a master plan for the rebuilding of the city. And uh, so we did that. We raised quarter million dollars and uh, brought him in in fairly short order. And then I have uh, I've stayed connected with them. I'm currently on the, uh, the architecture committee, which reviews architectural plans for uh, the various structures that are being built. That's been a very, very successful effort. Uh, Sounds like it, yeah. Being modeled in uh, a number of other places that have had major, major storm damages. <clears throat> so all that's uh, proved enjoyable, and I uh, you become involved with uh, some social groups, and do a lot of boating, and uh, all that good stuff. Have a boating club, and, uh, so it's uh, very enjoyable. The calendar is full. <laughs> <laughs> we like it that way. Pretty much every day. Sure. And, uh, well, we're down there. Actually, we come back to Lafayette to relax. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. But we we also come here. This is a base for visiting our children and grandchildren. And, and you've been here a general. long time. And we have friends here. Sure. Uh, and it's nice in the summer here. Right. And this summer has been very pleasant. Yes. Well, last summer was pleasant. Yeah. So it's worked out well. We'll see how long. We keep doing that, uh, going back and forth. But. Just enjoy every day. I want to ask you, uh, do you have a Purdue tradition that you'd like to share with us that comes to mind? Any tradition? A Purdue tradition? Mm -hmm. Such as, say, commencement or some people like Boilermaker Special. Well, some of you been homecoming years ago when yeah. you used to have all those displays. Right. You know? Well, I, I could, that would be one. When mm -hmm. I was at Rochdale Co op, we participated in the homecoming parade with a with a float. Right. And uh, I remember one in particular, which I thought sure would win a prize, but it didn't. We were going to play Illinois, and so we had a uh, float with an Indian representing Illinois being moved in and out of a furnace by Purdue Beat. And uh, the sign on the side of the float said, we'll be to you, Illinois. And uh, at least engineers will understand what BTU means, British <laughs> thermal units. But <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, that was a, yeah, a good great. tradition, which yeah. uh, I think they're sort of reviving now, but not anything not, like it used to be. Not like they used to. A lot of people, I remember. And then it was always nice to be at the game, and they announced the winners, you know, and you could right. still go around, and I used to walk around and see them. I'll leave any closing comments that you'd like to share with us? Uh, anything that uh, we've talked about you want to elaborate on? Or? Well, um, I guess, as I said, there was a critical thing that happened when I made that decision to stay at Purdue to develop the optics programs, sure. which uh, turned out to make for a, a really interesting and enjoyable yeah. career. You know, I was, as a result of that, I've traveled a lot, and uh, we, we spent a, spat, uh, a sabbatical year in Germany with our family, which was Very nice. enjoyable, where I was doing laser velocimetry research. But I have friends around the globe, and uh, in fact, we have some Japanese friends that visited us in Florida this past Christmas. 
So it's been a great career. And Purdue's been very good, and their uh, retirement plan is very good as well. That's, that's right, yes. <laughs> so oh. I appreciate it. Oh, thank you very much, Dr. Stevenson. It's been very enjoyable. Thank you. Okay.